Good morning, everyone. So we've all used AI, and a lot of times when I use AI models of any kind, I always feel like they don't, they work, but they don't work. But what if models did work? What if I'm the government of Cambodia, I process millions of these forms every uh, year, and as I process them, what if a model could actually look at this data? What if a model could look at each of these forms that comes out, and as it processes them, pull it out into something that is immediately database friendly? What if I could trust it to believe that it wouldn't actually make stuff up? What if every single time the data worked, it was, came in the same exact form, same exact shape, and you could do it with any model without needing any fine tuning? And you know, what if I did record that demo and it wasn't real? So, and what if it worked on anything? Images, audio, text, PDF, and we could all build trust with these models to go ahead and, at some point, make stuff happen in a way that really, really worked. That's what I want to talk about today. And I want to show you that from my slides that we're going on to talk about, which is what happens when we can actually trust models. Because that's really why the models don't work today. Let me move on to my... So what we did is we did something incredibly silly. We made up a programming language. The name of the language is BAML, and my name is Vibov. I want you to go back to software. How many of you have written software? Just by a show of hands, roughly. A lot of you, as should be. How many of you have written software that fails 5% of the time? No hand. Oh, some of you. Um, you guys, uh, well, panic. Because we don't write software like that. If software fails 5% of the time, it doesn't work. I'm going to change one word really fast. Anyone have a guess of what we're going to feel? We're going to feel very different with, the, with just one word changing. And the reason for that is because I don't actually think that's OK. For a lot of people, when they use an LLM, they're like, oh, it kind of works. That's really good. It works just 95% of the time. That's amazing. But I don't actually think that's OK. The problem is, what's happened now is that the burden of reliability has already shifted away from what it used to be. When my, when my app died, and let's say the cloud provider died for that reason, I can just tweet out to all my users, email every single one of them, and say, GCP is down, and they will forgive me. If my engineers are coding and they can't push the GitHub and GitHub is down, they will forgive me. It's not my fault. But now as an application developer, all of a sudden, if your application hallucinates, it's not OpenAI's fault. It's not Anthropic's fault. It is your fault. And this is a paradigm shift that's happening already. And that is why AI feels so flaky and so much like a demo most of the time to most people. Why am I talking about this? My name is Vibov. I spent most of my time working on really, really weird pieces of technology. Um, I've worked on things like AR tech. And if you think about that, think about a really good window and detecting what a window is. A really good window is, by definition, not visible. These systems don't have confined problems. They don't have great solutions. My co-founder, Aaron, worked on distributed systems at massive scale, scaling out EC2 all the way to the systems they have today. And at some point, we decided to go out there and try and solve this problem for everyone building AI applications at a company that we now call Boundary. You have probably seen websites that look like this. We don't do that anymore. We write .tsx files. And we do this for a variety of reasons, but mainly because we are able to write more reliable, maintainable websites because we get a couple of nice things. We get pretty colors. We get static analysis. If I forget the slash at the end of the button at the bottom, it yells at me. I can't push code. If I did that here, it would not yell at me. I would instead just have shipped a broken website. That's exactly why Facebook made React. We've also had all sorts of different file extensions made. We used to write data pipelines like this. We don't do that anymore. We use IPYNB files, because the iteration loop when you're doing data analysis of any kind needs to be incredibly fast. And no matter what you do with a Python file, no matter how readable it is, it's not the same as a Jupyter notebook. Some of you might have seen agentic code that looks like this. Maybe you've, some of you have even written it yourself and checked it into a code base. I think this is just horribly ugly. Like, this code doesn't make me say it's beautiful. And code is an art form in my eyes. The way that we write code is a way of expressing ideas. And this code is code that I want to go delete six months from now. It's temporary placeholder. This code feels a lot like this website code. It's a temporary placeholder until we found React. And the reason that this code feels so temporary is because 
of a couple things that seem very similar. We have a bunch of strings. Strings suck for writing code that is maintainable. If you've ever done any sort of context engineering, it's virtually impossible. You're just smashing F strings together and hoping that you didn't make a mistake adding something up. If you've ever changed one thing high up in your prompt and forgotten to change something else downstream, that's normal because you're working on a string-like code base. Strings are effectively useless for writing maintainable code. Every time a new model comes out, you have to somehow convince your engineers to hope that they wrote the right abstraction so that line of chat completion.create actually works. Maybe, maybe it doesn't. New modalities come out. And most importantly, that a lot of people overlook is how long it takes you to iterate. Let's say finding the best prompt for any given problem takes you 100 tries. If it takes you one minute to try every single prompt and to test it out, that's 100 minutes. You're going to give up before you find the best solution. That's why most people don't end up on the same best solution. They've just stopped. If testing took you one second, like iterating in Jupyter Notebooks does, it would take you 100 seconds. You would find the best prompt every single time. A lot of these lessons we've already learned before. We've learned it from TypeScript evolving away from raw text files and templates. We've learned it from Jupyter Notebooks evolving from raw Python scripts. So why are we making the same mistakes again when we're going ahead and writing agentic code? So I'll show you BAML and see how it looks. And the best way to do that is honestly just code, because there's nothing better than uh, code, in my opinion. So what is BAML? Well, the first thing that we really said is, I'm going to change this to light mode. I don't code in light mode, so please don't judge me. But for the purpose of readability, we'll use light mode. The first thing that we said in BAML is prompts, are, we don't want to treat them as functions. Uh, we don't want to treat them as strings. We want to treat prompts as functions. Functions take in input parameters, they have names, and they have return types. Return types, as you can see, are written like regular code. You can jump to definition and see what they do. And sometimes, you might even want to embed some English into it, like you would in, oh, like you would in a prompt. But unlike every other language, what you get to do is you get to define functions with a new operator that we all now have access to almost universally. You can use an LLM. An LLM can be defined in any meaningful way, and then you get to write your prompt. But then you do something slightly different. What you do is you write your test cases. Yes, you should write test cases. If you're not testing your prompts, that's probably why they don't work very well yet. When you go write your test cases, you now get to go on to the very next part, which is right in your playground, right in VS Code or your editor of choice. You actually get to see the raw prompt in, uh, in your editor. If you can't see the raw prompt, then really it's the same as trying to build a website or using a browser that will hide the HTML and CSS from you. The model, unless you own the model end to end, is only really as good as the inputs that you send into it. So if it's not working, well, then you should read your prompt. So it should be incredibly easy to actually read your prompt. Your input parameters should be highlighted differently than your base prompt, because that's what the whole point of a function is. We know what is a prompt that I actually wrote over here versus the prompt that is being fed versus the user data that is being passed into the function as dynamic at any given time. When you're at it, you should be able to see the raw web request that you're actually firing off to the model under the hood. You shouldn't have to hunt through and write a proxy service to go figure out what that is. You should be able to see exactly what models you're calling in what order. In this case, we're calling GPT-40 mini, waiting 450 milliseconds if it fails, trying again, and then going to sonnet if it's broken. And all of that is defined purely in code, because I have an exponential retry policy attached to here. And if I were to go ahead and change this to three, my visualization immediately updates and lets me know what's going on. Code should be a, a way to express an idea, and discovering what ideas expressed should be trivial. But most importantly, what you should really be able to do is you should be able to know if your system actually works. You should be able to just see what's actually happening really, really quickly for any given test case that you write. If you had a multimodal test case down here, you should be able to actually see the images that you're passing in, and again, just test the model and see if it's actually producing the right data. And one thing you might have noticed is the model here is hallucinating or producing some backtick, backtick JSONs. And we don't really want that. So we're able to strip that out automatically without you having to think about it. 
It just works. But that's not that impressive. We can all write strip on a backtick backtick JSON. So let's see what happens when we as a language can actually go a lot further and make your life even better. Around keys. Oops. So in this case, the prompt is still very, very simple. All it is is it's the same prompt as before. I'm telling the model to output a resume, but I've told it a couple more things. I want it to do some reasoning before it actually spits out the answer. And then after it does that, I'm going to say, don't worry about quotation marks, because quotation marks are an artifact only needed for JSON and really only for humans, so let's ignore that. Well, the model does that exactly. The model spits out text over here. I guess it ignored my instruction on the quotation marks. And it doesn't matter. You only got the data types that you really wanted. Now, some of you might be like, OK, this BAML thing might be kind of interesting, but I'm not going to write my application in BAML. We understand that. We, are, we don't really expect you to. BAML is special because it plugs into any existing language of your choice. So if you go to TypeScript, for example, you now get a method in TypeScript called extract resume right over here that autocompletes. And resume is, def uh, is defined oops, to have a field that is name.experience that is guaranteed to be an experience type. If I went to my BAML code and changed experience to be a string type instead of an experience type, my TypeScript code reflects that immediately. So you get type safety across the way, no matter what you do. And if you go along the way to Python, you get the exact same behavior every single time. You get type safety in any language along the way. If I go back to my slides, the whole point of BAML is we don't really need to have a bunch of F strings to maintain our code bases. We don't really want to do prompting. What we want is code bases that are engineered, that are designed for reliability. And what that does is it gives us a couple of nice benefits. It gives us reliable and maintainable code bases. And why do we do this? Well, we made BAML completely air-gapped. It has no internet dependency at all. It's polyglot, so you can use it from any language along the way. Because if you are a C code base, you should still be allowed to use LLMs. You shouldn't have to spin out to a Python microservice. If you're a TypeScript code base, you should be allowed to use LLMs. BAML is built, uh, uh, built in Rust, so it's incredibly fast. has no um, issues on concurrency or anything else you might need. And it works with any model out there. Now, that said, I do get that we made a programming language. It's kind of silly in my eyes. So we said the least we can do is try and make it actually easy for people to go use. So I just went down and like, tracked our Discord messages over the last year and a half since we've been working on this project. Um, apparently, our team is uh, silly and really likes to stay up all night and respond to everyone. 50% of our messages are responded to within five minutes. If you try and message Discord right now, maybe you'll get responded to in five minutes, but we'll see about that. Um, but the reason we did this is because the language is very, very, very challenging for someone to go and consider. We now have over 1,000 companies that use us in production, all the way from some of the largest companies, um, some of the largest companies in the Fortune 50s, all the way to some government agencies, down to two high school kids, teams of two high school kids that build their entire applications on top of us. If you found this kind of interesting, there's a QR code that you can scan. We'll send some information. As we always say, BAML is just what started off as an idea between me and my co-founder. One night, late night, just looking at a lot of Langchain code and saying, this, this can't be the future. And we said something really crazy, which is, as a joke, let's make a programming language. What turned into a weekend of hacking has now been a great community that we've built with thousands of people as a part of it that are all helping move us along the direction that we hope is a more type safe, more accurate, more fun way of writing agentic code bases. And hopefully, this was, um, hopefully it's something that you guys will find fascinating as well. Thank you for your time. If this was fun, please come by to a workshop that we'll have later at around 11.45 about context engineering and how you can use advanced techniques to make agentic pipelines today a lot better. Thank you.